as those of you have, who have attended previous past PCC conferences, you know that we always end with an athlete speaker. So it's now my pleasure to introduce this year's athletes, final athlete speaker at the PCC conference, marathon world record holder, Paula Radcliffe. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just trying to make sure we're at it. I've had a problem with one of the videos, so I apologize. There's a video missing from the presentation. But first of all, I want to say what a pleasure it is to be here. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I think it's very important, this recognition of anti-doping, of how important it is to the athletes and of the athletes' integrity and rights within that. So it's my fundamental belief that every athlete has the right to that level and fair playing field to be able to compete and to genuinely know how good they can be and to not have their performances doubted. An athlete also has the responsibility to represent their sport and to represent themselves and to compete always with utter respect for the rules and for their fellow competitors to be a role model. Today I'm going to share some of my story about how important my morals, beliefs and integrity have been in shaping my career and in shaping the person that I am today, and some of the tools that I used for getting the very best out of myself. But key in all of that has been the strength and importance of the team around me, and by the team around me, I mean, yes, the coach, the physio, the S&C, everything like that, but primarily my parents and my family in teaching me the, the groundings and the moral groundings, and I do believe that that's an onus that is on every parent out there. We all have a responsibility to teach our kids to carry themselves in the right way and to treat other people in the right way. And it's something that goes back to, to something my grandma taught me when I was very, very young. She was big about putting everything into life, 100% into life, and doing everything that you can do, but also in treating everybody with respect and giving it 100% every day. And if you don't get there the first time, you try again, you work another way. And she taught me to step outside of yourself. Every once in a while, to, to take a step outside of your life and look back in on the way you're living life and the way you're conducting yourself and make sure that you're happy and you're proud of that and that you're treating people in the right way. So work hard, aim high, keep working hard, keep looking for different ways, but above all, treat everybody with respect. So the biggest thing in my career was setting goals uh, and working towards those goals and, and for every athlete out there, it's the same. It goes back to, to one of the first things that my coach told me, aged 11. Aim for the moon, because even if you miss, you'll still land amongst the stars. And that's what athletes do. They set goals, and they work towards those goals to try and achieve those dream goals that may never get achieved. For me, one of my dream goals was to achieve an Olympic medal. And I, I never got that, but I never, ever regretted setting that goal, because without it, I wouldn't have achieved many of the other things that I, I did in my life and I'm still trying to now and I wouldn't be the person that I am today without trying to, to stretch myself to, to achieve that. Um, another saying that we had very often was no limits. So yes, set goals and try and stretch yourself to reach those goals, but don't put a cap on it, don't put a limit on it because what happens when you get ahead of those goals? What happens when you're up on them? You're not gonna slow down, you want to find out exactly where your limits lie as an athlete. So it's about investing everything in the process to be able to, to stretch yourself as far as you can and try and reach up to those goals. And it's my belief that when you do achieve those goals and you achieve them the right way, having played by the rules and having respected everybody else in that game, then it has to be so much sweeter and it cannot feel as sweet to an athlete who has cheated and who has stepped outside of the rules to take a shortcut and be able to achieve that. So I think I've been really lucky to have a long career, thankfully due to, to the team around me and to a genuine passion and love for, for what I do. I can honestly say that running athletics is my hobby and it, it's my love and it's something that I would have done had I not been an, a, an, a, an elite professional athlete. Um, so I've been very lucky in, in being able to make my career doing something that 
that really just makes me happy. And I was being able to, to test my own limits within that because success is never about one person alone and it's about having a passion. So whether it's in the field of anti-doping or, or what it's in, if you've got a genuine passion for trying to do the best that you can, if you understand, as I believe that anti-doping's fundamental role is to protect the clean athletes, every clean athlete out there has that right. And at the moment, we're still battling to be able to, to provide all of those rights to those athletes. And it's an ongoing battle, and it may not be won anytime soon. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to invest everything that we can every single day in trying to move towards that goal and working together. Because it's a, it's a success that comes from representing what we do with honour and with that passion, investing all of that in it. And we're all on the same team whether we're an anti-doping agency, whether we're the lawyers, whether we're the governing bodies or the federations or the athletes, we're all in the same boat. The majority of athletes want everybody out there to do what they can to protect clean sport and to provide them with those rights that we've talked about. And it's also remembering how much your actions reflect on the other people within that team so that all of those interlinking bodies understand how what they do impacts on the other people's lives and careers. So key in all of this, whatever walk of life you're in, is, is perseverance. Um, this is one of my favorite photos because for me it epitomizes perseverance. Uh, I won the World Junior Cross Country title back in 1992 and beat uh, Chinese athlete Wang in, in the process. But that day I set myself a goal of working towards being able to add the senior title to that. And it took me nine years to get to, to this day in, in Ostend in 2001 when I was finally able to win the Senior World Cross Country title. And for me, it was sweet that it was in a kind of sprint finish as well. I mean, it, it was in a lot of mud and into the wind. Um, but it still felt like I, I was able to win in a sprint finish. And a lot of people said and thought that I could never do that. Um, but what this photo also means to me is trusting your instincts. And I think as an athlete, you have to do that. Whatever walk of life, you have to tune into that inner voice that tells you what's right, why, what's right and what's wrong and what's the right way to do something. And this was one of those rare days in my career where I really knew intuitively inside exactly what moves I should make and when I should make them in the race. And that doesn't happen all the time. It didn't happen when I set the world record. Um, but this day, there was just a complete calmness uh, that came with it, that I knew I was ready to race, but I also knew which moves I should make and how I should play it tactically. And I think it's important that we all occasionally listen to that inner voice that, that tells us something, and it may not make us popular. It may not look like it's the right move to make, but sometimes having that confidence to, to tune into that is really, really important because life throws up challenges and we have to adapt to them. We have to find ways around them. And we have to sometimes think outside the box a little bit and tread a path that's not been trodden before to be able to achieve those goals. It was also important that day because it cemented in my mind that I had done what I wanted to do on the cross country and I could move on towards the, the marathon. Uh, and the marathon is something that's very special to me. It inspired me first as an 11-year-old stood on the streets of London watching Ingrid Christensen run by en route to setting a world record and wanting one day to be able to run that fast and that strongly in amongst all of those men and moving quickly in amongst all of that passion uh, and atmosphere that was the London Marathon then. And by the time I came to, to be able to run it had grown even more because life's constantly moving. It's always about new targets and moving on to something that sets that passion. Uh, and that's what the marathon is for me. It's a, it's a magical unique event. It's not just you against the distance. It, it's you against the other competitors, against the course, against your body and, and your mind. Uh, and something in that brings together a camaraderie that I think it, it's very hard to, to find in any other sport where 55,000 people might take to the streets on the same day, largely share the same experiences, the same ups and downs within that race, uh, and will support each other and bring out a camaraderie, a warmth on the streets that it's you get addicted to it and it, I think it's very, very hard to, to find somewhere else. And that's why I think I love the marathon so much. You learn about your strengths, you learn about your weaknesses. You learn about how to come through difficult times uh, and how to rely on the preparation that you've done. You learn about how key that preparation is, having put all of that work in. 
and what that means. And you learn about stepping up onto that line, being ready, being prepared, and also being ready to, to think and change things on the course as well and on the route. Uh, so that's why the marathon is so important to me and why I think I want to see... I want to see it protected and I have to say honestly that I was in Paris last week for Paris Marathon and some of the events that transpired around that hurt me because I felt that it hurt the sport of marathon running uh, and hopefully it can all be sorted out but I think damage might have been done to, to the sport of marathon running and that hurts me. So when I... When I started competing, there weren't a lot of things around. And when I was nervous, I, a lot of times I, I would read to, to control those nerves. And I was reading a book once by James Patterson, and he brought up the analogy of five balls in life that we all juggle. And for me, it was something that really, really resonated, resonated with me. Um, basically, he talks about these five balls uh, being career, health, family, friends, and integrity. And they're all really important. They're what we all juggle to, to get through our lives, to manage our lives, to make a success of our lives. But there's one key difference. And the career ball is made of rubber. So you can take a few more risks with that one. You can throw it higher and higher, stretch yourself, and try and achieve those goals. Because if you drop it, it'll bounce. And you can work it back up to the heights that you had it at before. It might take some time, and it might take some hard work to do that, but you can do that. The other four are crucial, and they're very, very fragile and very important, and we have to look after them all the time. I talked about the importance of family and friends, how they are the team around us, and they are what makes us strong. But the health as well is very, very important. Our bodies can do amazing things if we look after them, if we cherish them, if we feed them in the right way. And I also include mental health here, because I think if your mind isn't strong, if you're not able to step up there knowing that you've prepared everything well and the right way and look your competitors in the eye and know that you've competed fairly, then that is something that's missing in your health ball and your health ball is not fully intact to me. And integrity. Integrity is the most important one. Never be afraid to stand up and speak up for what you believe in, to be true to yourself. I think that's what came fr from my parents and, and from the way that I was brought up, but also something just innate in me. I can't pretend that there isn't unfairness and there isn't injustice in life and bad things don't happen because they do, and I've seen that too. But I do really believe that we get more from life and appreciate it more if we do it the right way and we stay true to ourselves and our morals and our rules of fair play and tr never treat another person as you wouldn't want to be treated yourself. Be able to look at yourself in the mirror each day and be happy with what you're doing, and if you're not happy, change it. And it may not always make you the most popular, and it may cause trouble, it may get you branded as the troublemaker, but you can look yourself in the mirror every day and know that you have stood up for it and been true for it. So I started that in 1998, when I was started to wear a red ribbon pinned to my vest, asking for better blood tests uh, and better anti-doping tests within sport. I carried it on, I guess, in 2001, when I held up the placard in Edmonton, EPO cheats out, asking for better protection of athletes so that we didn't have to compete against athletes that were cheating. And it's still ongoing today. And normally on this next slide, I talk about bouncing back from the heartache of Athens and the, the disappointment for me there of not being able to, to finish my Olympic marathon when I dropped that career ball pretty spectacularly. Um, but actually, the truth is that any of the setbacks and any of the barriers that you overcome in sport are nothing compared to the traumas and the, the difficulty, the, the period that I went through in 2015 um, when I had to, to come back from that. And it was honestly the hardest thing that I've ever faced. When the Sunday Times questioned my integrity, the thing that I hold most dear to myself, and I was accused of the very thing that I find so apparent, that was most alien to me. And it was really hard to be in a position where I couldn't prove that I had not done anything. And that tool is not available to athletes today. And I think that's the key take, if you like, from this session, is that we have to keep working towards that. Because when athletes are put in that position of doubt, they can't categorically say, here's the proof, I didn't do anything. We can prove when someone did something wrong, but we can't prove 
that someone's clean. And the only person in all of that, and I guess that's what got me through it, the only person who knows is the athlete themselves. The only person who actually knows the truth about what went on was me. And that helped to get me through it when I was shaken to the very core of myself, when I saw it affecting my family as well, and I had to make decisions. The biggest thing for me was to look in that mirror and get some perspective and say, okay, you know the truth. And so you keep standing up for that, and you keep hold, if you like, of the fact that you know the truth and you know that you didn't do anything wrong. And it was also a catalyst to me to fight, to be able to show that however unfair life can be and what it can accuse you of, it won't change you, and it won't change your priorities. And it also, I refused to let it make me bitter, to let it change the path that I was going to take anyway uh, and to keep working along that. So I had to make those decisions about whether or not I release my data, um, and that was one of the hardest decisions that I've ever made. I probably vacillated backwards and forwards many, many times, asked a lot of people's opinions, but there were two key things in that, and one was the, the ABP. might not be perfect, but it is catching people, and I didn't want to do anything that was going to weaken that, that I wasn't worth letting one cheat get away with it if they were going to, to be caught within that. But the biggest key thing was in that gray area, if you like, that I was in where abnormal values are flagged on, on the ABP were a lot of cheats, and that's a horrible place to be, to be in that mix with a lot of athletes that probably were cheating, but there were also innocent athletes, and there were innocent athletes within that who I didn't want to see have to go through what I had gone through. Um, and maybe they didn't even know they were in there. I know of an athlete that did and that tried to publish their data and was actually told by the Sunday Times that, don't worry, we're not interested in you. And, and that hurt, that hurt a lot, but that's when I say that journalists also have a role in the sport to do things the right way and to do things responsibly. But other athletes didn't even know that they were in that area and they shouldn't know the way the system works, they shouldn't know, they should be followed up on, the data should be followed up on, tests should be carried out. But those athletes shouldn't know that they're doubted um, because that could shake them more, I would say, if they're innocent than if they are guilty in that situation. The only people that should see that data are the experts who are qualified to see it, and they should see it in its full context in it, with all of the background that goes with it. And I'm grateful to many of those experts for taking the time to, to sit down to explain things to me and, and to help clarify and explain, explain the situation in my mind because that was a big question and a difficulty for me to come through. But the biggest thing, as I said, was that I refused to let it turn me bitter and to stop me doing what I wanted to do to fight for the credibility of a sport that I love and every clean out athlete out there. And as a parent, to give every child that wants to get involved in the sport that hope and that goal that they can see genuinely how good they can be, that right of competing on a level playing field and being able to prove that their performances were done the right way. And it's paramount that I show my kids this, that I teach them the same morals that I was taught growing up, that I support them in their dreams, and that they know they must always be true to themselves and stand up for what they believe in, not be afraid to stand up and say what they think is the right thing, because that is the strongest thing about you, is your belief and your passion and your willingness to work hard. So where does that put me now? Well, I missed um, London 2012. Um, it would have been an amazing opportunity for me to be able to compete on the streets of London, my closing Olympics. But sadly, um, injury put paid to that, and I wasn't able to do that. And I had to, to go through pretty much a career change at 40-something, um, which I think is, is quite difficult to adapt to. Um, and maybe I surprised myself a little bit that I didn't miss the, the competition quite as much. I was able to channel the drive and, and the competitive instinct into different areas of my life um, and to work hard to, to giving something back to the sport. So I guess I do that in a number of ways, with commentating, with doing some work um, with the AIU, um, with just basically staying involved in getting kids involved into running, being active and being able to work at the same time towards giving them a future, letting them realize the potential that they have inside and giving them a platform to be able to express that and, and see how good they are yet to not have their achievements doubted. 
uh, and have that gift that I never had to be able to prove that their performances are clean. And that involves a lot of work, I think, from a lot of people in this room and outside of this room. And we aren't yeah, that yet by a long way. Um, and I can't do too much to change things, but what I can do is make a small difference. And if everybody works hard to make just a small difference, then we actually start to make bigger steps forward and we start to work towards the end target. So it's about not looking at how big the task is ahead, but just trying to keep chipping away at it and keep working towards that. That is working towards that goal. I had a lot of unfinished business, as you can see with my foot. Sorry, that slide is, is just on there. Um, and somewhere I set about a year after that operation, the goal of being able to run one last time in the London Marathon. Um, and I was able to do that and, and close out my career on my terms, which I think was important to me. It wasn't important to actually perform then. It was important that I could step up to the line and I could finish that marathon and say, okay, now that's my decision to, to step away and it's not going to be dictated by my body breaking down on me and probably particularly because it was where I'd wanted to, to compete in that final Olympics in 2012 as well as being where my career had really started. So in conclusion, I want to emphasize goal setting, but most important, how important it is that we all juggle and look after these five balls but we're not afraid to take risks with the career one because with the others strong and intact, you can take risks with it. When you've got your health, your integrity, your family and your friends around you, you can take big risks with that career ball and just see. Just dream a little bit and see what you're capable of doing. But no. never, ever neglect that integrity because it is the cornerstone of everything. Always be true to it, even though life's not fair. We are who we are because of how we live our lives and what we achieve, and that's our legacy. Be the person that you can be proud of, that when you look back on what you've done with your life, that you're happy with what you did with it, that you have the courage to stand up and speak up for what you believe in, no matter how vulnerable or out there it puts you. Because we only get one life, we only get one shot at it, so we have to give it our very best shot. No regrets and no limits. Just do what we can with perspective, strength, resilience, and hard work, all the traits that athletes have to have, but everybody has to have in every walk of life. And the skills we learn and how we use them shape futures of sport and the sports that we love so much. And we all have that responsibility. Journalists have a responsibility to follow up on the stories that they see. And yes, an investigative role to play, but that has to be done with responsibility. It has to be not no shortcuts there either, no lazy journalism. Make sure that everything is fully fact-checked before you go ahead with it because you also have your integrity and your profession to, to represent and to represent in the right way. This is really important to me as well. Never set limits, dare to dream. Don't be afraid, afraid to push those boundaries. <coughs> but above all, laugh a lot. I think there's this conception that's used too much that if we're serious and committed to something we can't also smile and have fun uh, and I actually think that they go together if you enjoy what you're doing and you take the time to smile hard things become easier if you can smile through them and if you can may not make a joke out of it but just make lighter of it to be able to to go with it so it's really important I think in achieving something is, is to love what you're doing and to have that passion to see the big picture for why you're doing it. Uh, and that was why I did want to, to play a video of Seb's closing speech from London 2012, because I think what really touched me there was when he finishes at the end, and he said that when we look back on what we've done, we want to be able to tell our children and our grandchildren that when we did it, we did it the right way. And I think that's so important for everything that we do in life, that when you decide to do something, you put your heart and soul and absolutely everything into doing it as well as you can so that when you look back on it, whether it worked out or whether it didn't work out, you can work, walk away knowing that you gave it your best shot and that you did it as well as you could. And I think that's what's, what's so important, to keep working hard, to keep working cleverly, to keep working intelligently, to keep thinking of different ways that we can work at things, keep picking yourself up again and again, because failure is not failure if we learn something from it. But our greatest success is not 
staying up all the time. It's picking yourself up again each time that you're knocked down because it's fighting back and it's learning something from each one of those setbacks and taking something from it that will help us to get stronger all together in the future. It's about value and respect for that family and that team, being there for them, looking after our health wards and, and really just giving what we can to get yourself into that position where you can look back on your life and say with pride and satisfaction that when we laid it all on the line, when we did what we could, that we did it with everything that we had, we went after every goal and did the very best that we could. So that's basically what I wanted to, to convey today is that we are all part of that one team uh, and to work together as much as we can to, to keep protecting and keep working towards providing every right that the clean athletes out there deserve. I don't know if, yeah, it's working. Matthias came from Switzerland. Um, thank you very much for your talk and sharing your thoughts. One thing I had been missing, I remember it was in 2000 or so when you ha held out this sign, EPO cheats out. This was great. I had been working there already 12 years in anti-doping and I longed for athletes speaking out about it. You helped us really going further in your fights. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so I have a question. Um, with all your injuries and then trying to push it later in your career, aren't you sacrificing one of your five cores, and that is your health? What's your comment on that? Um, no, I don't think I was. Um, I, I often get asked the question, um, was I ever angry at my body because it would break down and I would pick up injuries? I would say, no, I'm re actually really grateful for my body for being able to absorb as, as much training as it could uh, over the years and allow me to, to perform, allow me to stretch and reach for the, those, those goals and the, those aims. Um, and it's inevitable, I guess, when we ask a lot of it, that they reach the point where it just can't keep responding anymore and, and fatigue and injuries start to, to crop up, but then the body heals and the body heals really well. Um, I think I only really had one serious in injury, but it just kept recurring, I guess, through, through my career, and that was the, the foot injury. Um, and now I think medical science has moved on so much that that would never have been an undiagnosed stress fracture back in 1994. That wouldn't happen. Um, to an athlete now, so I don't think that that fits into the health question because you stop in time to allow your body to recover from those injuries and part of the mental health side is also pushing and being able to, to stretch and, and try and achieve those. So I would argue that my mental health wouldn't be as strong if I hadn't have been able to, to go after those goals. Thanks very much, Paula, for your talk. I welcome everything you said, um, but a difficult question, I'm afraid. Um, obviously, you haven't released your um, athlete biological passport data, and if I understand correctly, you've been advised that it would somehow weaken the ABP if you were to do so. Is, is that correct? Uh, that was one of the reasons, and the other reason is that in its context on its own, my data doesn't actually do any good. You have to see it in amongst every other athlete's data out there. Um, to be able to see it in context, and you have to know all of the background behind that. Um, a lot of that I did try to explain. Sure. Um, the fact that mine was the values in question were part of the pre ABP, so they weren't carried out under the same criteria, um, and, and that did definitely impact it. Um, so, yeah, that's, you, that's one of the reasons that I didn't want to, to give data out there to enable people because it does happen. We know that. Athletes manipulate the, the ABP. They know which range they need to stay in. Uh, and I think the more 
help we give them in trying to, to manipulate that, that's actually detrimental to, to trying to catch them. I think the ABP can be improved and needs to be improved and do a better job. And so maybe I haven't ever said that I won't at some point release that because I think probably for me it would help me the most. Um, sure. But it doesn't help clean athletics. Yeah, do you think there's still a level of misunderstanding about the sort of pre-ABP data yeah. and the ABP data amongst um, members of the media, um, members of the public, etc.? Yeah, definitely. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Hello, my name is Oliver de Haan from the Netherlands. Uh, thank you very much. You were very passionate. And you know, these are for I, I work for the National Anti Doping Organization, and these are the easy athletes for us who speak uh, who speak up so clearly about clean sport. And in fact, the the, the clear cheats they are not that difficult either. Yeah, we need to find them, but then it is quite clear, and we've got all the rules. I would like to ask you, what is your perspective of um, yeah the, the anti doping rule violations that were not intended that way, the intentional doping rule violations? Um, I think that that's, that's a really <clears throat> valid question, and I think it's, it's difficult because if you ask any clean athlete out there, they know that there are a lot of expectations, a lot of restrictions, a lot of restraints of demands placed on them to help the anti-doping system work. And they're happy to do that because they're trying to work with the system to, to eliminate the, the cheats. Um, but I think it does have to be understood that there, there is a big commitment to that. I mean, asking a, a young athlete to be always on top of, of where they're going to be sleeping every night, having changed that, to update their whereabouts, to keep an eye on everything that's changing in terms of what you can and can't take, um, that, is, that is difficult. And I think it needs... The support, I think, in, in the UK, I think athletes are, are lucky because there is a lot of support from UK anti-doping in terms of helping them understand when changes happen, when different prohibited substances come up, and just a willingness, I guess, amongst athletes as well to, to kind of play safe, so just not to take any risks to get every kind of supplement checked uh, and rather not take something, and a cold just takes a little bit longer to, to get rid of the, the, than it would do if you were in the general public, I guess, um, is just something that you kind of have to, to learn to, to live with. And I think it's a lot of ideas that we've bounced around amongst the athletes and on athlete commissions as, as well. A lot of athletes would like to be tracked all the time because it's actually easier for them. Um, but they maybe wouldn't quite be so happy if their phone was draining all the time because of that, that tracking device being active all the time. And it, it's trying to, to find that balance that makes it as easy as possible for the athletes who are already making huge sacrifices. But at the same time, it has to be easier for, for the testers to be able to find people and, and to, to get everywhere. And maybe that needs to be, I mean, I've talked a lot about diplomatic passports as well for, for testers so they can get properly unannounced into areas. There are still big areas of, of the world where athletes are not treated the same as they are in the US, in Australia, in, in Europe, um, and they're not tested at any time. It just doesn't happen yet, and it needs to, to get to a point where it can happen, so where no one can hide. One more question, who wants to ask one? Noah? Uh, piggybacking off the first question, do you, do you ever feel like your career was in conflict with your other core values of your health and family and friends and integrity? No, no. I felt a lot of times when I knew there were other people in my sport who were at conflict with, with my values, um, but I don't ever think that, that my career was. No, I think there were some things that I had to adapt to. Things like public speaking doesn't come naturally to me. I was probably really shy about doing something like that. I was quite happy to jump in a race and express myself in that way. Um, but to stand up and speak, that was something that I had to, to put myself out of my comfort zone to, to, to be able to do. Um, but no, I think I, I was lucky in that really all of my core values were probably expressed really well by the sport that, that I chose uh, as well. Um, so I think that did work together. And that's why maybe I, it, it hurts me and it angers me when I see athletes harm that sport and harm by association the other clean athletes in that sport because they um, choose and make decisions that are not you know, sort of aligned with the, with the spirit of the sport. Thank you. 
Um, this is ordinarily where I'd say thank you for coming, uh, but I'm going to do it a little differently because we did it a little differently for this three days at the PCC. So at the beginning of this conference, I challenged you to be honest, to be authentic, and to have the difficult conversations that were necessary to move anti-doping forward. I challenged you to be better tomorrow than we are today. I wasn't talking about this conference. I was talking about anti-doping in the long term. I was talking about the passion and integrity in our sports leaders that the future of anti-doping panel and Paula Radcliffe talked about. I was talking about the collaborative and creative solutions to anti-doping's most pressing problems that were discussed. I was talking about being the leaders that people will follow, like David Howman talked about. And I was talking about holding the executives in sport to the same ethical standards as athletes, like Becky Scott, Kara Goucher, Ali Jawad, and Caleb Skinner talked about. Because I assure you that they will not forget that we promised to do this. For them, for clean athletes, and for clean sport. Because like I said in my opening statement, they deserve it. Thank you for coming, and I look forward to holding everyone accountable, including the PCC, to accomplishing the goals that we set out during PCC 2019. Thank you for coming. Um, before you leave, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank just a couple more people. Um, King's College uh, hosted a great conference. This venue is amazing from this auditorium to the views of the Thames uh, on the eighth floor. I heard more comments about being able to see London from the conference, which was a unique experience. Um, so thank you to King's College and the Bush House for hosting this event. Uh, thank you to the Drug Control Center. Uh, I see Professor Kim Wolf in the back there uh, for allowing 150 of people who attended this conference to walk through a real lab, many of them for the first time, uh, and to experience what sample testing analysis and the hardworking people that work in anti-doping labs every day uh, do to make our lives a little bit easier uh, to protect clean sport and to protect clean athletes. So thank you to King's College, thank you uh, to the Drug Control Center, and have a great flight home. <laughs>